On Palm Sunday, they hailed Jesus of Nazareth as King of the Jews. He fulfilled what the prophets had said, but the people of Jerusalem were disappointed by his actions or lack of actions. To find out more, stay tuned to this episode of The Prophetic Connection. I'm on the Mount of Olives with the Holy City Jerusalem over my shoulder. 2,000 years ago, on Palm Sunday, Jesus passed this way on a little donkey. He came from Bethany, which is in that direction, crossed over the Mount of Olives somewhere here, and entered the Holy City by the Eastern Gate. The crowds thronged the Mount of Olives. They were full of expectation. They cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a day of triumph for him, his disciples, and for all of Jerusalem. But within days, the cries of Hosanna had become, crucify him, crucify him. What was it that changed their cry? What was it he didn't fulfill in their expectations of the coming king? What went wrong between Palm Sunday and the events later in that week? At the time of Jesus, Israel was not lacking for a king or leader. Rome was the occupying power of the day, with its various governors appointed over Israel. In addition to this, King Herod was building up his kingdom, refurbishing the Jewish temple and other magnificent palaces. The Jewish people also had their various religious leaders, providing leadership for spiritual and political matters. Yet Israel longed for more than this. Well, many of the Jewish people in the first century longed for a restoration of the dynasty of David, their famous king, King David, whose son was also famous, Solomon. And that dynasty had ended when the Babylonians destroyed Israel and took away in captivity many of its people. And so for centuries, the Jewish people longed for a return of a righteous king empowered by the Spirit of God, somebody with the prowess militarily of a David and the wisdom and insight of someone like Solomon. And others wanted somebody like that, but maybe a little bit more, sort of a plus, somebody who was especially close to God and could bring about renewal and restoration for Israel. And Israel would be exalted among the nations. That's what many people hoped for in the time of Jesus. God promised that King David's kingdom would somehow never end. The prophets foretold of a Messiah figure that would one day come to free Israel from her enemies. The word Messiah, in Hebrew, the Mashiach, or Christ in the Greek, simply means anointed one. At the time of Jesus, the Jewish people were hopeful that this special messianic ruler, anointed by God, would soon arise. Well, the Jewish people's uh, messianic expectations really originated in Scripture itself. What for them is Scripture, of course, is the Old Testament. And so the prophets foretold the coming of a righteous king. The prophets foretold that the stump of Jesse, that is the Davidic tree that has been cut down, well, out of the stump that's left, a new sprout will grow and a new king will come. And so that's what fired these hopes. And then, of course, other people along uh, in the centuries would come and make promises. And even in Jesus' own lifetime, uh, there were people who thought that they were special, anointed of God. Maybe they were the Messiah. And sometimes that led to conflict and violence and people were killed. So there was a hope that the scriptures would be fulfilled. And there were those who interpreted the scriptures, such as the people at Qumran. They interpret the scriptures, Isaiah and other scriptures. 
thinking that they could predict when that Messiah would come. So there was a bit of a messianic fever in the air, in some places anyway, in Israel uh, during the time of Jesus' life and ministry. Because there were many in Israel professing to be Messiah, and because many Jewish zealots were determined to overthrow Rome's occupation of the Promised Land, Rome kept a careful eye on those who might threaten her power. King Herod, also known as Rome's puppet king, did his best to keep the Jewish people submitted to both Rome and his rule so as to keep the peace in Jerusalem. In addition to this, many Jewish religious leaders kept a careful eye out for those who would disturb the peace. Someone claiming to be a Messiah not only threatened their leadership, but also meant that Rome might tighten its grip on the Jewish people, making life even more difficult for all. Israel was divided very much under a Roman thumb, and there was a longing for redemption and restoration. And of course, Rome was the great power. And for a lot of people in the Mediterranean world, that meant oppression and taxation and sometimes brutality. And there were many peoples that wanted to throw off the Roman yoke. And that was certainly true for many Israelites in Jesus' time. It was the perfect time for a Messiah to come and liberate the Jewish people from their enemies. The temple was run by a largely illegitimate priesthood. The king of Israel was a powerful builder, and he was unrighteous and dominated by Rome. Israel needed their Messiah now. But what exactly were they looking for in this messianic figure? Well, when uh, the Messiah uh, would come, it was believed that certain things would be seen. The Messiah would be perhaps endowed with extraordinary power and spiritual insight. He'd be a great, great teacher. Maybe he'd be a healer too. Maybe he'd be an exorcist like David's famous son Solomon. Maybe he would uh, replicate some of the great wonders and signs seen in the wilderness during the Exodus wandering. Perha perhaps uh, provide manna in the wilderness or water, or perhaps cause the, the uh, Jordan River to be parted and people could walk through it. And in fact, there were some people in the first century who promised those very signs. So that was all part of the messianic expectation at that time, which is why some people asked Jesus, what sign do you show us? In other words, what sign can you do that would prove that you really are God's Messiah? During the ministry of Jesus, he had performed many miracles. He had healed the blind and lame. He had set captives free from demonic oppression. To the Jewish people, many of his miracles were signs proving that he was the Messiah. However, his final and greatest messianic miracle occurred in the town of Bethany just before he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. In Bethany, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This was considered something only the Messiah of Israel could do. News of this incredible messianic miracle made a great stir among the people and leaders of Israel and among the Roman authorities as well. After this miracle, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to the cheers and praises of Israel. It is clear that the masses of Jewish people were beginning to believe that Jesus was in fact their long-awaited Messiah. But what they failed to notice was his mode of transportation. Jesus did not come riding on a white horse to liberate Jerusalem. He came on a donkey in absolute humility, just as the prophets foretold. He was the king Israel was longing for, but his victory would be won with humility. When Jesus came down the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem, on that great day, we call it Palm Sunday today, the people glorified him, they praised him, they waved their palm branches before him, they put their clothing down on the ground as kind of a red carpet treatment. And it's interesting what the rabbis say. They say if the people of Israel do not repent, he will have to come on a donkey into Jerusalem. If they do repent, they skip, he skips that stage and he comes directly back as the king over Israel in his great pomp and ceremony. And we do believe that when he comes, there's going to be a great repentance. In fact, Zechariah 
Chapter 12, verse 10 says that they will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for their only son. And I believe that uh, the people will turn from their sins. I believe that God has promised an end time salvation nationally for the people of Israel, and they will be saved, and it will be through Jesus, who is their long prophesied Messiah and King. The people of Jerusalem expected a conquering Messiah. They were under Roman occupation. They knew what the prophets had said, and so they expected one who would come and throw off the change of Roman bondage. When Jesus seemed to fail to do that, they were disappointed in him. Uh, listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 45. Psalm 45 is considered a royal psalm. It speaks of the coming Messiah. And the excitement is in the words of the psalm itself. It begins, Psalm 45, verse 1, My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. So this is about the coming king, the Messiah of Israel. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And then he goes on to say, You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh. And there's a reference to a Messiah who's ready to fight for Israel. But Jesus didn't do that with the sword. He did it with words, but not with the sword as depicted in this psalm. Almighty one, with your glory and your majesty, and in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And then it goes on to say, and the New Testament writers pick this up to make the identification between the psalm and Jesus of Nazareth. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. When we turn to the book of Hebrews, we find the New Testament writer of Hebrews making that identification with Psalm 45. Here is what he writes in the first chapter, beginning in um, verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But then these words that come directly from Psalm 45. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. When we get near the end of the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, this idea of the Messiah having tremendous joy is emphasized again in chapter 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So these are the verses speaking of the theme of the Messiah and of the joy he had and the joy that was set before him through which he endured the cross. Which, what was that joy? It was the joy of seeing salvation come to the whole human race through an all-rugged cross on a hillside where he would become the Lamb of God who would lay down his life for the sins of humanity. The people of Jerusalem and of Israel were disappointed in Jesus because he did not overthrow the Romans, but he overthrew sin uh, for eternity. And so we have these prophetic themes that he fulfilled in his life in detail. For example, from the book of the pen of the prophet Zechariah, writing in chapter 9, in verse 9, who describes the coming of the Messiah to the holy city Jerusalem itself. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. 
He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. They might have expected a Messiah to ride on a white horse, which would have symbolized that he was a conquering king. But according to the prophet, the Messiah will come riding on a donkey. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And we go to the New Testament to pick up the theme that's found in Matthew 21. Listen to these words. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, I'm standing on the Mount of Olives. And Bethphage is just over there behind the camera. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks, says anything to you, you shall say that the Lord has need of them. Immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fall of a donkey. Notice the specific language. And notice how the New Testament writers linked what Jesus did with the prophecies of the prophets of Israel to say that he was fulfilling what they had predicted, doing so in detail. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. And there again, the linkage between Jesus and King David, the king of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Words reserved for the Messiah, Messiah, Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? Remember, most of Jesus' ministry until this point in time had been in the north, in Galilee. But more recently, in fact, just days before Palm Sunday, in Bethany, on the other side of the Mount of Olives, he raised Lazarus from the dead. That caused a tremendous stir, especially in Jerusalem. It made the religious authorities uneasy. It's one thing to do miracles in Galilee in the north, but to come to the seat of their authority, to the temple area itself, to the holy city, Jerusalem, That was simply too close for their comfort. And so they're not sure. Some of the people are caught up in the excitement, but they're not really sure. This is just Jesus, the carpenter from Galilee. Is this the Messiah? So you can see the uncertainty in the question that's asked. So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, Matthew tells us in his account that immediately after this, Jesus went into the temple. And here's what he did. Um, He drove out all those who brought, bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now the fact that he did that and he used his authority to overturn the tables in the temple precincts might have raised their excitement and what will happen next? Well, surely after this, it's a simple thing to go and overturn the Roman occupation. We know that he can do miracles. He can even raise the dead to life. So it's a small thing for Jesus to overthrow a Roman occupying force. But when he didn't do that, they became disappointed. And then of course, where had been Hosanna, on Palm Sunday, now in the days that followed, it turns and changes to become crucify him, crucify him. So they did crucify Jesus. They put on his head a crown of thorns, symbol of humility. They nailed him to a cross. Messiahs overcome. They don't succumb to crucifixion. So they didn't understand what was going on. How can he be the Messiah when he is led as a lamb to the slaughter? Which is what Isaiah the prophet said would happen in Isaiah chapter 
53. And what they failed to recognize was in all of this, Jesus was fulfilling the words of the prophets, but more importantly, he was fulfilling his Father's will. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was fighting against the kingdom of darkness, the sin that has enslaved all humankind throughout history, which was a greater occupation and domination than the Roman occupation of Israel at that time. But he would conquer with humility and the symbol of a crown of thorns and a cross, which have, the cross is the greatest symbol of hope the world has ever seen. But it's only those who understand the words of God through the prophets who understand the significance of that old rugged cross. So on Palm Sunday, events began to unfold. He was coming for the people of Israel. He was their conquering king, but they failed to understand the nature of his calling and what he was about to do for them in the holy city called Jerusalem. Thank you.